if you ever um, if you ever get to stand where I'm standing, you uh, you come to really love the way the Lord works in the music before the message. Um, praise team, um, thank you so much. Hey, in the first service, at about this point, I told Crystal Bass, wave, to save me a Ground Zero Dragon Boat packet. I have mine. My question is, do you have yours? And if you don't have yours and you don't plan to get one, there's going to be a young person that needs sponsoring. So make sure you get yours or talk to Crystal before you leave today. All right. <clears throat> He is risen. He is risen indeed. Do you believe that? Well, if you do, boy, do I have something for you today. I'm just going to tell you right off the bat, the title of the sermon is The Jesus That Calls You to Stop Playing It Safe. All right? So this is not, you know, this is not going to be one of those real easy, comfortable times. You can go to sleep if you want to. The Holy Spirit's going to wake you up himself. All right. You ready? John fourteen twelve. Jesus was speaking with His disciples and He said, Whoever believes in Me will do all the works that I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Now I want that to sink in for a minute and I want you to, to decide who said it and do you believe it. So let's just process that for a minute. Jesus said, whoever believes in me, now you have to ask the question, do you believe in Jesus? I mean, it's a yes or no answer, and it's really easy to say, yes, I believe in Jesus. I believe in God. I believe in heaven. Yeah, that's all true. The Bible's true. Now where's lunch? I get that, but that's not where we are because I want you to pay attention to this Scripture. He, Whoever believes in me will do all the works that I've been doing, and they will do even greater things than these. Now, what does that mean? Well, there's a little example over in Matthew 14, 28 and 29, where Peter said, Lord, if it's you, they were out in a boat. It was a storm. Jesus came walking up on the water. Jesus was walking. I mean, you've heard that, right? Jesus walks on water. Somebody said one time, only Jesus walks on water. Not according to this. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, come. Then Peter got out of the boat, and he walked on the water, and he came towards Jesus. Peter got out of the boat. He walked on the water and came towards Jesus. The Jesus who calls you to stop playing it safe. Why do most believers not break bad habits? Why do most believers not take risk, build relationships, or have adventures? Frequently, it's because we want to be comfortable. We want to play it safe. We want to thank the Lord for a safe home and a safe environment and, and making things predictable. You didn't think I was going to go there. There are four price tags for playing it safe. We're going to look at four, four things, price tags for playing it safe. The first of the four price tags is that playing it safe will limit your impact. How many of you would like to live your entire life and then die and go to heaven and have never made an impact? Would you like that? That sounds silly, doesn't it? Well, do we sometimes live that way? 
All right, so I want to tell you a story about limiting your impact. There's a story at a Bayside church. The pastor's Ray Johnston. It's in Sacramento, California. It's a very large church, and they do a whole bunch of stuff with uh, fundraising and big compassion campaigns, and they're involved in lots of different ministries um, from all over the world. And they had just finished up this huge financial campaign for Compassion First, and uh, Ray Johnson's phone rings, and it's Don Brewster in Cambodia. Don Brewster is a guy that works to save girls in Cambodia that are sold into sexual slavery. And he'd been there for a few years, and he had had a meeting with the military general in Cambodia responsible for that operation. And the military general said, listen, these girls are being sold into sexual slavery, some of them as young as four years old, abused repeatedly over and over at night. And every time we go to make a raid, the corruption is so bad in Cambodia that the pimps and the girls are all gone. All we get is where they were. We're not being effective. And the military general said, I want to start my own independent SWAT team. I want some Cambodian officers that I can trust. I want some Western officers I can trust. Nobody's going to know about it. It's going to be a complete secret. It's going to be under my direct command. All the corruption's out of the window. Nobody's going to know about it. We need to make a difference. There's only one problem. We need $250,000. And Don Brewster called Ray Johnston and he said, Hey, buddy, can you fund this project for me? And the pastor said, I just finished a big financial campaign. It's not a good idea for a pastor to get up right after one big financial campaign and start another one. <laughs> See? And, and so Ray said, Donna, I, I, we just can't do it right now. And so he hung up the phone. And you ever had God on your back? And so Ray Brewster started realizing that man, this is a big deal. I, I at least need to talk about it to the senior staff at the church. And so he goes to church and he talks to his staff. He tells them about the phone call and they say, what kind of spiritual wimp would say no to the first possible campaign to really do some good to put people that sell girls into slavery in jail and deliver these girls? What would you do that for? And he says, okay, fine. So he sends a text message to Don Brewster before the camp, before the meeting's over and says, can you send me a business plan? We're going to try to do something. And Don Brewster sent him a business plan, and usually those business plans have lists of things they need, Bibles, basketballs, um, hygiene kits, stuff like that. This business plan was different. It said, I need 25 bulletproof vests. I need 25 buttonhole cameras. I need video equipment. And there's a long list preparing this SWAT team. And so the church decided, it's a big church, remember I said that? Five campuses in Sacramento, California, 10,000 members. They were going to have 14 total Christmas Eve services. So they decided that they were going to try to raise some money towards that $250,000 during those Christmas Eve services. They did that. And the church did not raise $250,000. They raised $400,000 sent the money over there, and here are the text messages that started coming in. Hi, Ray. The SWAT team just found and arrested a trafficker who had trafficked dozens of girls each week. She's the one on the CNN documentary. Another one said, conducted our first successful raid on a brothel, rescuing four girls and arresting the, man the manager. Here's another text. We have taken in seven Cambodian girls who were trafficked in China. This could lead to the arrest and returns of hundreds of Cambodian girls who have been kidnapped. The abuse they underwent will break your heart, but today they are thriving. One more thing, the arrest have started going to trial now. So far, we're three for three on convictions. The final text, or the last one I'll read to you, says, We have three girls rescued in China awaiting return to Cambodia. There are 21 more on a waiting list, which will probably reach the thousands. Abusers who are, can no longer harm kids are locked up in prison. Girls are returned to their families after being helped and helped to recover in therapy. And the whole project, 
almost did not off the, get off the ground. Why? Because Ray Johnston thought, maybe I should play it safe. Playing it safe will limit your impact. Playing it safe will shrink your faith. I can't find a single scripture in the Bible that says, come follow me, play it safe. What would have happened if the disciples had said, we're going to follow you, Lord. We're going to go to church every Sunday. We're going to tithe about 2% and maybe we'll help in the nursery. Took you a minute, didn't it? Playing it safe stunts our, um, stunts our growth. It's a great idea for young people to go on mission trips. Isn't that a great idea? Go out of the country. It's a great idea for young people to go on, on mission trips until it's your daughter. And if some other teenager wants to go on a mission trip to a foreign country, that's fine. Teenager wants to go on a mission trip to Kentucky or North Carolina or Atlanta. I mean, I can get there in just a couple of hours, especially if you press the gas really hard. But going to Trinidad is different. So when Rebecca told me that she wanted to go on a mission trip to Trinidad, I thought, wow, cool. And the, the, the next thought I had was, is my passport current? And how fast can I get there? And how do I need to book an open ticket? What's going to happen while she's there? What, what's the story about this trip? Is it safe? That was my thought. I went on the internet and looked, you know, Trinidad, Tobago, what's going on there? I have a friend that's there. I picked up the phone, had a chat with her. Can you guarantee that it's going to be safe? A thought is this, it's much safer for your daughter to go to Trinidad, learn to trust God, go public about her faith, serve the poor, and develop a heart of generosity for other people, and live where she actually has to depend on God than it will ever be for her to grow up into a community in a community without stretching her faith or learning to take risk. It'll deepen her faith, solidify her values, and possibly fall deeper in love with Jesus. Rebecca's here today, and I will tell you that Rebecca has never recovered from her trip to Trinidad. It changed and shaped and changed the person that she was, and it changed the God that she serves. Flavius, in the movie Risen, stopped playing it safe. It brought him closer to Jesus even when he didn't know what to say. Check this out. you've seen, yet still you doubt. Imagine the doubt of those who will never see. That's what they face. Playing it safe stunts your growth. It limits your impact. Shrinks our faith. Shrivels your heart. What if God were to ask you, say to you, I want you to go on a mission trip. And your response might be, I can't spend the time, God. But if he were to say, I want you to start tithing, and you were to say, I can't afford that, God. 
What if God were to ask you, I want you to go talk to that person about me? I'm afraid of that, God. What if he were to say, I want you to ask forgiveness from that person? I can't do that, God. What if Jesus were to say, I want you to lead a small group Bible study? I don't know how to do that, God. What if he were to say, I want you to work with junior high students? And you were to say, you've got to be kidding, God. For the next couple of minutes, a few minutes, I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you if you are willing to live today, if you're willing to live the way Jesus wants you to live. And I don't mean about doing better. I mean about getting out of the boat and walking towards Jesus. Heavenly Father, one of our greatest challenges is in the next couple of minutes. I pray, Lord, that you would challenge us to trust you, to live as though we serve a risen Savior who has risen in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Five ways to stop playing it safe. The Bible says, well, let me let me back up a minute. Um, Matthew 14, let, let me set this up for you, why, why the disciples were in the boat and such. Jesus had heard some disturbing news and had gone off by himself to get away from everybody, and the crowds followed him. And when they got there, Jesus recognized they were there, and he said, okay, you came to hear me talk and speak, and so I'm going to speak. And he talked apparently for quite a while, and the disciples said, Jesus, look, man, you've got to break these people loose. They have to go eat. And Jesus said, well, you feed the people. And they looked at him, and they looked at one another, and there was no trailer full of food that had followed them out there. And so one of Jesus' miracles occurred right there, five loaves, two fishes that fed 5,000 men and the women and the children. And Jesus said to the disciples, y'all get in that boat and go across the Sea of Galilee and I'll come to you here in a little bit. Y'all go that way. Then he went back to the crowds and he said, now you've heard me talk. It was a pretty good message. You're full. Y'all go home. I'm going up here on this mountain to pray, which he did. And the Bible says that as night came, a storm came, and in the wee hours of the morning, the disciples were still trying to get across the lake in that boat. There was big wind and waves carrying on, and Jesus walked out onto the water towards the boat to the disciples, and they thought he was a ghost. And Jesus said, don't be afraid, it's just me. I told you I was coming. And Peter says, if it's you, tell me to get out of the boat and come to you. Now, have you ever prayed a prayer that you thought, oops, I probably shouldn't have prayed that? Because Jesus said, come on, big boy. Get out of the boat. Come on. And Peter does that. He gets out and he starts walking on water. Now, I know you immediately want to go to the part of the story where Jesus took his eye, or Peter took his eyes off of Jesus and started to sink, and you're going to beat Peter up because that's happened for 2,000 years. But I have never gotten out of the boat. So I don't really need to throw a rock at Peter. But today, I'm going to invite you to get out of the boat. Walk on some water. I know you're not Jesus. I don't think you're Peter. But I think he's going to call us out of the boat. Because the Bible says, even when Peter took his eyes off of Jesus and started to sink, guess what happened? Jesus was right there. He immediately scooped him up. At least Peter was doing something and stretching his faith and moving his faith. So, here we go. Stop saying no to everything just because it's scary. Stop saying no to everything just because it's scary. Fear will cause you to miss out on the best thing that God has for you because you're afraid. 
Is God calling you to do something? Has He knocked on your door and wanted you to do something? Wanted you to say something to somebody? Wanted you to go somewhere? Has He called you or tapped on your heart and you've said no? And not really because you don't think He's real or not because you don't think He's God or not because you're too good for it. You're just scared. Say yes, it may be the very best ride of your life. Start saying some dangerous prayers. Start saying some dangerous prayers. The most dangerous prayer. Think about it. Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and He is praying to the Lord, and He knows that right after this, there's going to be some people that betray Him. The disciples are going to run away. There's going to be Peter who denies Him, even though He walked on water. There's going to be a crown of thorns. There's going to be a whip. There's going to be spit. There's going to be ridicule. There's going to be mockery. And then there's going to be a crucifixion and a death. In that, in that death, God the Father is going to separate Him from God the Son, and it will be terrible, horrendous. And Jesus still said these words, Thy will be done. After this message today, tomorrow, when you get in your car and you start to drive, I want you to say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. I want you to say thy will be done about four times. Put it in bold print in your brain and hang on to your steering wheel and see what happens. Because God could knock on that door and tell you to do something amazing. It may be scary, but I want you to pray that dangerous prayer. John Ortberg, funny name, great book. In the book, If You Want to Walk on Water, you got to get out of the boat. He wrote a book about a fellow where he told a story about Doug Coe that worked in Washington, D.C., doing ministry to businessmen in Washington, D.C. In the story, there's a guy by the name of Bob, an insurance salesman who had accepted Jesus Christ and started going to Doug's Bible studies. And one day, Bob walks in and he says, Hey, Doug, this scripture, ask whatever you will in my name and you'll receive it. Is that real? Now, it's in John 14, twice in John 15. It's in John 16, too. That's just in the Gospel of John. We won't talk about the other Gospels, but he said it a bunch. Is it real? And so Doug said, well, it's not a blank check, Bob, but I mean, yes, he means it. And so Bob says, okay, fine, I'll pray for Kenya. And Doug said, do you know somebody in Kenya? He, and Bob said, no. And Doug thought, well, here's an interesting challenge, and I want this young man to grow in his faith, this young Christian. So I tell you what, Bob, you pray for Kenya every day for six months. If something extraordinary happens, you pay me $500. If nothing extraordinary happens while you pray for Kenya for six months, I'll pay you $500. Bob says, that's a deal. I'll do it. I'll pray for Kenya for six months. He'd been praying several days, several months had gone by. Nothing occurred. Bob's at dinner one night at a business meeting in Washington, D.C., and there's a lady there. And in the meeting where the dinner he's having dinner, she says that she helps run one of the largest orphanages in Kenya. Well, Bob roared to life and peppered her with questions, to which she says, you're very interested in my country. Have you been to Kenya? And Bob said, no. And she said, would you like to come? Bob went to Kenya, checked out the orphanage, and he was overwhelmed at the poor condition, the very, very low level of medical supplies and things, the, just the, the terrible state of affairs in Kenya. He came back to Washington, D.C., and he started writing letters to large pharmaceutical companies to tell them about what he'd seen in Kenya and at this orphanage. The orphanage called Bob and said, Bob, there are a million dollars worth of medical supplies that have flooded into this orphanage because of the letters you wrote. We want to celebrate, and we want to show you what happened. Will you come back to Kenya so we can have a party? Bob went back to Kenya. He went to the orphanage. The president of Kenya came to the party. 
The president of Kenya said, Bob, would you like to see Nairobi? I'll give you a, to a tour of Nairobi. Bob jumped in the car with the president. They're riding around Nairobi, uh, Nairobi, and Bob says, what is that? The president said, it's a prison. What kind of prisoners is that? He said, they're political prisoners. Bob said, that's a bad idea. You should let them go. Finished the tour, got on the plane, came back to Washington, D.C. A little time goes by, and the State Department of the United States government rang up Bob and said, Bob, did you go to Kenya? Bob said, yes. Did you talk to the president of Kenya? Yes. Did you talk about political prisoners? Yes. What did you tell the president? Well, I told him he should let the people go. Turns out that the State Department of the United States had been trying to gain freedom for those political prisoners for years. They were turned loose, and the president of Kenya said it was because of Bob. Start praying some dangerous prayers. You ready? So far, so good. You like that, don't you? Start praying some dangerous prayers. That's not bad. Stop saying no just because it's scary. That's not bad. Point number three, get out your wallet. Now, I didn't write the sermon. This is a series. I didn't write it. It was already in here. Scott didn't write it. It's a series. It comes out of California. It's, for, it's sort of in response to the movie Risen. And it leads up to Easter. It's just a point in the sermon. I still want you to get out your wallet. All right, here's the reason why. Bayside Church, large church, remember five campuses, 10,000 people, they made a decision that they wanted to do something powerful for compassion projects around the world and in, the, in their own area. So they set a goal of $2 million. They rolled out the campaign for $2 million to this church, said we want to raise $2 million. And this is the reason we want to do it. The first family that talked to Pastor Ray Johnston after this campaign rolled out was a group that had been saved in his church three weeks earlier. They said to him, hey, look, we have figured out how we're going to do some sacrificial giving. See, we're not talking about the, the, the tithes and offering, the thing that's already factored in the budget. He was talking about sacrificial giving, which is hard because unless you have a money tree or you just got more money than you can do anything with, sacrificial giving means... Sacrifice. There you go. Y'all not asleep. I told you the Holy Spirit wake you up. All right. So this family told him, said, we figured out what we're going to do. We're going to quit smoking and drinking for three years. And all the money that go to cigarettes and alcohol, we're going to give to the church. Ray said, well, cool. That's perfect. That's great. The seniors got involved. Um, there was a uh, there was a man that was about to retire. And uh, he talked to his wife. And he said, uh, honey, what is instead of retiring, what if I work for the next two years and my entire salary for the next two years goes to that Compassion First campaign? Now, when Cheryl told Pastor Ray Johnston that, she followed that up. They don't make men like that anymore. Teenagers got involved. A teenager, uh, a daughter was sitting with her, um, a teenage daughter was sitting with her mom and dad. She's 15 years old. The dad was talking about the Compassion Campaign. They had recommended that they talk about families, and the dad had looked at the budget and looked at how they were, and, and he said, he said, guys, we can serve on the different projects and help by service, but we really just cannot give anything money-wise above what we're already giving. The daughter had been praying about it. She looked at her dad and she says, well, what if I were to give up my cell phone for the next three years? Now, she's 15. Dad said, well, if you gave up your cell phone for the next three years, that'd probably pay for the whole campaign. He, she said, <laughs> good. She slid her cell phone in the middle of the table. She said, I'll do it. There's the phone. Turn it off. All that money goes to compassion. And before dad could close his mouth again, she said, what are you and mom going to do? They had been discussing the need for a new car or the desire for a new car. They prayed about it and decided for three years that car probably would last. And so that family together gave $18,000 over the next three years to that campaign. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that the dad 
thought his teenage daughter walked on water? How about the wife when her husband decided to work for two years and give the salary to the church for that compassion? Did he walk on water? Sure he did. How about the pastor when he looked at those brand new Christians, been saved three weeks, just brand new believers in Jesus Christ, and they're going to make a lifestyle change and give the profits of that lifestyle change to the church? Are they walking on water? Is that a step of faith? Did they get out of the boat? Ray Johnston's secretary walked into the church, in, into his office one morning with a brown paper bag, crumpled paper bag, and Ray saw in the top of the bag crumpled up dollar bills and money in there, and on top of it was a note. This is what the note said. Dear Pastor Ray, we really, really wanted to go to Disneyland, but we really believe this compassion stuff is better. Here's all our money. Courtney and Micah, ages 5 and 7. Do those parents think those kids are walking on water? Are they out of the boat? Are they stretching their faith? Now, it just so happens the day that Ray presented that to the congregation, there was a Disneyland official in the congregation. So I'll let you take the rest of the story there. Stop watching... Try living. Stop watching. Try living. Jesus can't do anything through you until you let Him. But He said in His Word, you will do even greater things than I'm doing because I'm going back to the Father. And the next verse, the next verse was, ask anything in My name, and I will do it. Why? To glorify the Father. Now, I'm not talking about doing something for you. I'm talking about doing something for what? Somebody else. What's at stake? Realize what's at stake when we start talking about the work of the Lord and the heart of Jesus Christ. What's at stake? Guys, if... The praise team will come back. What's at stake is everything that God created you to be. Every single thing that God created you to be. Probably the worst four words in the human language is, it's too late. But if you're sitting in the chair today, it's not too late. If you're young, if you're old, if you're in between, it's not too late. And if somebody's telling you it's not too late, it is certainly not Jesus Christ who died on a cross for you and rose from the dead. He will never tell you it's too late. There's work for you to do, and it's it will stretch your it will increase your impact. It will stretch your faith. It will grow your heart. And what's at stake is all of the world will either see or not see Jesus Christ based on what we do or don't do. Now I got to tell you, if it's His work, it's His responsibility but it's our responsibility to answer the call. I don't know how Jesus does all of the crazy, wild, fantastic things He does, but that's His job. Our job is to get out of the boat and to walk towards Him. And if we fail because we're weak, if we fail because we get scared, Peter didn't drown. Jesus scooped him up. Maybe you're here today 
And you believe in God, but you've never gotten out of the boat and said, Lord Jesus, I want to be your follower. I want to officially be one of your children. I want you to forgive me of my sins. I want you to come into my heart and life, save my soul. I want to live for you and with you forever. Today's your day to get out of the boat. Maybe you are here and you've been a Christian, but you've been so comfortable for so long that this crazy nonsense I'm saying today sounds brand spanking new. And you just want to start over. You want to jump out of the boat and run towards Jesus Christ. Maybe you have a broken heart that you think cannot be healed. Or maybe you've got a past that you think you cannot overcome. Jesus didn't set limits. He didn't set barriers. He said, I came to this world so that you can be saved. And there's no, there's no questions there. There's no limitation. <laughs> We're going to pray. And if you fit one of those categories, I've already asked. I went to Scott and Lisa yesterday and I asked them to get out of the boat. I want you to, if you fit in a category of, that we've talked about and you need that Lord and Savior to do that miraculous work, I ask them if they would be the ones to pray with you as you step out of the boat. Because they're in a whole new world and a whole new place in their life. And they're our pastors and they're going to step out of the boat with you. So when we pray, I want you to come forward if you fit in one of those categories. If you're ready to be His son or His daughter, if you're ready to give your heart, if you need to start over, whatever it is, I want you to come and they will pray with you. Our Heavenly Father, we need You. We love You. We believe You. We believe You are risen from the dead, that You were not dead, that You were powerful, and that You will honor Your Word. And we step out of the boat today. As they sing, if you have need of prayer, come.
Scott and Lisa continue to pray, I'm going to invite all of you to do something. Scott and Lisa, Hannah Ruth, their life has been given to our church as our pastors. And I want to know if you're willing to step out of the boat with them in a whole new ministry because they have a whole new world in life to look at and a place to be. And God gave them to us. So if you're willing to support their ministry in this new endeavor that they work to reckon and figure out how to move forward without Caleb present with us here. He'll always be present in our hearts. If you're willing to do that, I want you to stand and I want us to just gather right here at the front, right around Scott and Lisa. And I want you to pray with us as a church. And I want you to commit to getting out of the boat with them and to being their church. I know everybody can't get all the way here, but come as close as you can. we are so very thankful for the gift of our pastor Scott his wife Lisa for Hannah Ruth and for Caleb and Lord while we can't understand all of the things that you have in store and all of your plan we are confident that in the middle of the storm in the middle of the waves and the raging sea that you walk to and fro on the water and that you will tell us not to be afraid but Lord we don't want to be hovering in a boat looking for a ghost but Father we want to step out boldly for you and with you and in the ministry of Scott and Lisa we pledge our hearts our love our support our compassion and we promise Lord to support them and move with them as you lead our church together. We're excited. Our hearts hurt. We're afraid and it's scary, but God, we know that you are powerful and that you will lead and direct. And we submit to you and we give our pastor and his family to you. And we ask, Father, that you would give them the strength to stay in the middle of the storm, but walk on the water towards you and we will walk with you. You are our God and we are so very thankful to be your people. In Jesus' name. Now, I will tell you that um, God laid something on my heart this week and I uh, did this in the first service, and I'll just tell you that I'm a little bit afraid to do it. Um, I started not to do it. It was I get in trouble with Scott and Lisa for it, but I've been in trouble before. It's not uncommon for me. I know that we can't answer and fix all of the things that come with losing Caleb and all of that heartache. But there is a little worldly, just a little worldly thing that we can make a difference in. Some little thing that we can do that's connected to this world that just makes it easier. Scott and Lisa are going to need another car. And i got to tell you, when I call Scott and I need him to pray for me, I know he would walk to me, but I don't want him to have to. Um, And not because of any connection or anything that they've asked. They've actually asked not to do it and I can't get away from it. And it's just for Marcus and Barbara, we want to participate. 
if you want to participate, only if you want to, only if God's calling you to, if that's one of those dangerous prayers you're willing to pray for Him, then for the next couple of Sundays, at the end of the service, there's going to be an offering plate right on the table, right behind the sound booth at the end of the service. Anything that goes into that offering plate will go towards them. We can certainly put your name on the envelope, make your check out to Waterbrook Community Church. We'll get it to them. You'll get credit for it on your contribution sheet. But it's just something that I wanted to do. If you want to, fine, whatever. But I want you to commit as a congregation every day this week and for the foreseeable future to pray that God will touch and anoint their ministry. They're our pastors. We're so glad to have them. And we're excited about what God's going to do. And we're going to celebrate Caleb's life every day in their ministry, in their heart, and what God does. Thank you, Lord, for a great day. Thank you, Lord, that you are doing a work that changes lives forever. Make us bold. Give us grace. Give us courage to get out of the boat. In Jesus' name.